Good evening. Welcome to the last Burgess Lecture for the uh, fall 2008 season. And uh, before we introduce the speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Jack and Margaret Burgess, who are with us tonight, sitting in the front row, uh, who's the Burgess Endowment, uh, supports generously this event and others. And Jack and Margaret, great seeing you with us uh, tonight here. Our speaker is Joe Locri, Vice Chairman of Cummins Incorporated. He's held that position since August 2008. Prior to that, Joe was President Chief Operating Officer of Cummins, who, uh, headquartered in Columbus, Indiana, the world's largest independent diesel engine manufacturer. And uh, he's been on the board of directors uh, of the company for some years. His background is human resources and had a number of uh, positions at, at Cummins. Uh, he has championed a disciplined culture in which employees work together to create common tools and processes to solve complex business challenges. And he was telling us over dinner there are many of those throughout the world. And uh, Cummins is a Fortune 250 company. It has 40,000 people uh, working for it worldwide in 150 countries. Joe is a graduate at the University of Notre Dame, and he started his professional career in ISEC, who I think he'll tell you about. And he's a proud Irish American like yours truly and has some uh, nice distinctions to go with that. Uh, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor in 2008 and named to Irish America Business 100. He's on the board of uh, the Business of Ireland Chamber of Commerce. He is, uh, resides in Columbus with his wife and son in uh, medical residency. His speech and lecture tonight is on ethical leadership, the cornerstone for sustained business success. And Joe, welcome back to Notre Dame. It's a pleasure having you with us. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Pat, for that introduction. And uh, to the Burgesses, I know Jim. Uh -huh. and, uh, and Jim and I were on the, on the National, NAM, National Association of Manufacturers Board together for, for several years. And so uh, uh, when I was invited to speak here, I immediately thought of Jim when I saw the, the Burgess Lecture Series. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I can, I can be here. Uh, <clears throat> I think, as always for me, I get, to come back to, well, I get to come back to campus a lot, and so as always, it's nice to be back. Uh, from my point of view, I owe an awful lot to the place. Uh, as the oldest of eight children whose parents were not college educated, Notre Dame broadened my horizons and opened my eyes to the world at large. In fact, it was spring semester of my freshman year 40 years ago, though that seems hardly possible as I think about it, that I took an international economic growth class taught by Professor Peter Walsh, and it totally changed my perspective on things. Like many students, I was struggling uh, with where to aim my life. Until then, I thought I was headed down a path that somehow involved math and science, my two best subjects in high school. That class, however, spurred me to take a broader interest in the world and to get involved in international activities around campus. This led me to join the local chapter of a, a then campus organization called IASEC, which is a French inc inc acronym for an organization that was created in 1948 in Europe. Its purpose was to promote international understanding and cooperation through a variety of student exchanges and cross-cultural experiences in the hope of preventing another world war. I'm still involved in the organization as an advisor, and I'm happy to say that the organization is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year, and, and it now has a presence in more than 100 countries with chapters on more than 1,100 campuses worldwide. As you, some of you probably know, I know some of us definitely know, the 60s were a time when many students were not happy with the ways of the world, me included. And involvement in this organization became a way to channel my energy into something constructive and important. But that wasn't the only channel for me. As a result of one of those now famous late night student meetings with Father Hesburgh, the university started something called the Program for Nonviolence, which was led by Father Amon. A number of us, of, student, of us students felt this was an appropriate name for a leader given where life as we knew it seemed to be headed. 
I took several of the courses the program offered, and more than anything else, I enjoyed studying the writings, poetry, and lifestyles of Martin Luther King, Thomas Merton, and Gandhi, all of whom were rooted in strong values and who promoted change through nonviolent means. I remember walking into class one day, and there was our guest professor for the day, anti-war activist Father Dan Berrigan, who was on the run from the FBI, in fact, was on the news that early morning at the time. In those days, uh, this campus was pretty alive with activism and idealism, racism, civil rights, feminism, and peace were the topics of the day, and causes for many long, lively debates and organizing efforts to promote change. I learned a lot about life and the pursuit of happiness from my days as a student. And probably most memorable phrase for me was a statement made by Gandhi. And he says, pretty simply, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. Uh, now back to Isaac for a minute. I got so involved with ISEC at Notre Dame that I traveled throughout the U.S. and the world, starting more local chapters, raising money, finding ways for the organization to get involved in the issues of the day. My first international trip uh, was to Japan for three weeks in March of 1970, right in the middle of the spring semester of my junior year. Uh, by the time I graduated from, from Notre Dame in 1971, I'd become full-time president of the organization, and it was through ISEC that I first got introduced to the concept of corporate social responsibility. ISEC needed to find ways for the organization to become more relevant to the issues students were concerned about, so we organized events with global flavor around such topics as the environment, apartheid, approaches to low-income housing, etc. At one point, I even found myself on a stage arguing for nonviolent change with the leaders of the radical, sometimes violent SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, as part of a social role of management conference in the Netherlands in the early 70s. Uh, I was fortunate. Several members of the board of the ISIC organization were early proponents of corporate responsibility in the 60s, and it was through them that I was introduced to Cummins. And in 1972, secured Cummins' involvement in a program to develop black South African students and to help break the color bar in that country. About that time, I read an article about J. Irwin Miller, the chairman of the company, in which he commented on what was happening on campuses in the late 60s, and I'm, and I'm quoting here. It ought to be self-interest that moves businessmen to identify with the revolution. If they are really far-sighted, if they could really get out 25 years and look back, they'd say, I wish I had done that. The only thing that would prevent them from doing so is short-sightedness and the lack of awareness that they cannot flourish in a sick society. Here is a place where I think business and professions are often short-sighted. They somehow feel that they can flourish regardless of what goes on outside their walls. Most of the groups that perished in the world felt that way. I was kind of captured a little bit by his view of what was going on in campuses and, and business, what business reactions should be. So through my interactions with Cummins, I found a company that was strongly values-based with great people and a thoughtful, responsible leader who wanted to grow his company around the world. In short, I discovered a place that brought it all together for me, and even if I had to move back to Indiana, and I've been fortunate enough to spend uh, the past 35 years working for what I think is one of the best companies in the world. But from my point of view, I thought it was pretty, pretty amazing when I reflected back how one class uh, can affect a person's in entire life. As I said, I'm very happy to be back on campus. I'm also especially excited to have been asked to speak on a subject that's been close to my heart for a long time, ethical leadership as the cornerstone to sustained business success. Let me be clear, I am not claiming to be an expert on the notion of ethics as it relates to business leadership. I am, however, a strong believer in the business case for ethical leadership, and I've been fortunate to spend my entire working life in a culture that values how things get done as much as it does the bottom line results. In fact, at Cummins, we are absolutely convinced that doing the right thing in the right way leads to a stronger bottom line. 
Before I go any further, I want to take just a few moments to give you some sense of who we are and what we do at Cummins. Cummins, as Pat mentioned, is the world's largest independent manufacturer of diesel engines and related components. We are also the largest global supplier of compressed natural gas and hybrid engines for on-highway trucks and buses, and we are the leader in the application of renewable biodiesel fuels and the remanufacturing of older engine and component products. In addition to producing engines, we're a leading maker of power generation products and have four components businesses, which manufacture filtration products, exhaust after treatment systems, turbochargers, and fuel systems. As Pat mentioned, we're a Fortune 250 corporation based in Indiana that serves cu customers in almost every country and territory in the world. Cummins employs nearly 40,000 40, people worldwide, including 6,000 today in the state of Indiana, and our sales in the last four quarters have totaled about $14.5 billion. We have become increasingly global in recent years with about 60% of our sales so far this year coming from outside the United States. Our products range from small engines for equipment like irrigation pumps, forklifts, and home generators to medium and heavy duty engines for pickup trucks, big class eight over the road trucks and construction equipment, to high horsepower engines for mining equipment, power generation, commercial marine applications, as well as oil and gas applications. And we also sell a variety of our comp uh, components uh, that we make to our competitors. We've also been on a bit of a roll the last few years. Cummins has reported record sales and earnings every year since 2003. And 2008 may be another record year despite the economic challenges we all face. During that period, Cummins has also been recognized for its efforts in a number of other areas, such as corporate responsibility, sustainability, diversity, human rights, innovation, and absolute commitment to the improving the environment. This recognition is nice, but I bring this up simply to point out the parallels between strong financial performance and a commitment to all of the company's stakeholders, employees, customers, suppliers, our communities, governments, and yes, shareholders too. While corporations need to make money to reinvest in themselves, we must not forget that making money is the result of designing and manufacturing products that people need or want at prices people are willing to pay. The privilege to do so is granted by society in the first place and requires that any major decision is taken with the clearest possible understanding of the views of and the impact on those who have a stake in the decision. In other words, the corporation is a trustee of the public good. I wish I could take cre credit for this observation, but the truth is that all of us at Cummins today are simply stewards of a legacy of corporate responsibility that was established decades ago under the leadership of J. Irwin Miller, whose family founded Cummins. Next year will be our 90th anniversary. As you may have guessed from some of what I've said earlier, no single individual has had a greater influence on Cummins than Mr. Miller, who joined Cummins as a general manager in 1934. Mr. Miller, if you believe it or not, remained extremely interested, if not active, in the business until he passed away a few years ago at the age of 95. Uh, I can't tell you the number of lunches I've had with him to keep him up to date on the business and the Socratic method he used to back me in a corner on whatever issue I was dealing with to make sure that we were thinking through it very clearly. Along with his many business accomplishments, he was the premier leader of his time on corporate social responsibility and business ethics. In fact, he helped organize the March on Washington, and Martin Luther King called him the most progressive businessman in America. And in a note appropriate for this presidential election year, Esquire magazine ran Mr. Miller's photo on its cover some 40 years ago above the title, This Man Should Be the Next President of the United States. Mr. Miller was a man very much ahead of his time in many ways, and he strongly supported the notion that to be successful, a company must operate under a banner of certain guiding principles, including a vision, mission, and clearly defined values. 
And that leads me to perhaps my single most important point of the evening. Creating a culture of ethical behavior doesn't happen overnight. Rather, it's the cumulative effect of making decisions, both big and small, every day in a manner that would bear up under public scrutiny. It's about understanding that any company is only as strong as the communities in which it operates and embracing the notion that corporations can and must contribute to society in ways that go beyond making profits and providing jobs. It's accepting the fact that the right choice is not always the easy choice in being strong enough to make the difficult call. It's about acknowledging that an organization's leaders bear a special responsibility to set the correct tone for its employees and provide them the tools to handle that responsibility. It's about everybody, everybody striving to do the right thing every time, every day, but also being willing to learn from our mistakes. You may have heard the saying that character is what you do when no one is watching. Well, Mr. Miller kind of took it one better. He demanded that Cummins employees act in a way that would stand up to scrutiny if their actions were plastered on the front page of the local newspaper for their mothers to lead. To give you an idea of Cummins' heritage as it relates to corporate responsibility and its ethical obligations to society, I'd like to share the following quote from the company's 1972 annual report. While some, some still argue that business has no social responsibility, we believe that our survival in the very long run is as dependent upon responsible citizenship in our communities and in the society as it is on responsible technological, financial, and production performance. In that same annual report, when Mr. Miller was still the company's chairman, Cummins articulated its commitment to corporate responsibility, which was based on the following six propositions. First, Cummins should understand the societies where it does business and link that understanding to the selection of new plants, market penetration, and the consideration of potential ventures. Second, the company has a responsibility to use part of its resources, both people and capital, to the respond to the needs of the society where it conducts business. Third, Cummins was obligated to identify and eliminate potential consumer problems before they occurred and to personally determine the quality, safety, and pollution output of its products before they reach customers. Fourth, the company should continuously monitor how its actions were affecting all of society, starting with the lives of its employees. Fifth, Cummins' workforce should reflect the populations the company served in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, ethnicity and economic standing. And finally, the company should actively work to anticipate social issues and provide both the resources and a point of view to help solve them. Now, this was 36 years ago, and the ideals captured in these six propositions continue to guide Cummins' actions today. While we're on the subject of things that endure, I'd like to share three short stories from Cummins' history that illustrate how values can and should stand the test of time. The first occurred in the late 70s when Cummins was being encouraged by the government in South Africa to build engine manufacturing facilities in the country. Cummins already owned a 20% market share of the diesel engine market in South Africa, and adding manufacturing capability certainly would have grown our business there. Cummins initially agreed to make the investment, but on the condition that it be allowed to do business in South Africa the same way it did in other parts of the world. Specifically, Cummins made it known that its workforce would be integrated, including supervisors. This was a time when apartheid was the rule of the day in South Africa, and the government refused to allow Cummins the freedom to integrate its workforce as we saw fit. So the company declined to build the plant. A European competitor stepped in, built the plant, and Cummins lost all of its business in South Africa until apartheid finally ended. Henry Schacht, Cummins CEO at the time, summed up the decision like this. Our view was that you don't need to have all the business in the world. You have, fundamental, you have certain fundamental principles, and if they can't be followed, then it's not business you want. 
The next two examples are more recent and illustrate the challenges a company can face when trying to balance the needs of competing stakeholders. In the early part of this decade, Cummins North American heavy-duty engine business was at a crossroads. The company had lost significant market share and this piece of the business, which at the time was the company's largest, was losing money, lots of it. The company was faced with a very difficult choice, radically restructure the business to reduce costs, improve quality, or get out. We opted to stay in, but the decision came at a significant cost to our hometown of Columbus, Indiana. Because of the market dynamics at the time, we had more assembly capacity in our heavy-duty engine manufacturing system than we had demand for our products. In very simple terms, we had two North American assembly sites when we only needed one. After much debate, we decided to consolidate our North American heavy-duty assembly operations in Jamestown, New York, effectively closing our flagship plant in our hometown of Columbus and resulting in the loss of several hundred jobs during what was an already difficult time for the company and its employees in Columbus. As you can imagine, the decision caused an uproar in Columbus and our reputation took a hit among residents and employees who had come to look upon the company as the one constant in the community. It was also extremely difficult for many of the company's leaders, including me, who feel a strong affinity for Columbus and still do. <coughs> still, as it turns out, it was the right decision. Our assembly line in Jamestown was more modern and flexible, used state-of-the-art quality control technologies, and was better able to accommodate an upturn in demand that would, we hoped would come as the economy and our products improved. And fortunately, we were right. The move saved the company, has saved it, at least $30 million a year in costs since then, every year, and was a crucial part of the turnaround of this important business. Today, Cummins is the clear leader in the North American heavy-duty engine market with more than 45% of the market, and our engine business is very profitable. When we made this decision, however, we promised the Columbus community that we would work hard to bring new business to our now-empty plant. I'm pleased to say that today, because of our strong financial performance over the last several years, uh, we are in the final stages of opening a new light-duty diesel engine manufacturing line in Columbus in the same plant we left six years ago. The plant's expected to employ 600 to 800 people by 2010, growth that would not have been possible without the tough decision we made in 2002. My third story also deals with the changing dynamics of the diesel engine industry, this time as they pertain to the impact our products have on the environment. For years, standard diesel industry practice, as it is in some cases still is in many industries, the practice is to fight government regulation. We took a different view and, in fact, played a large part in developing the original Clean Air Act, but especially the groundbreaking 1977 amendments to the Act. In this case, regulations were the, around the amount of pollutants that engines are allowed to emit into the air. To give you a little perspective on the issue, diesel engines used in on-highway applications today run 99% plus cleaner than they did 30 years ago, with much of the improvement coming in the past decade. Now, I think we can all agree that cleaner is better when it comes to the air we breathe. But reducing engine emissions while maintaining fuel economy, power, reliability, and all the other features our customers require at an affordable price is no small engineering feat. Many of these customers are small and medium-sized businesses who fight to keep their heads above water, sometimes even in good times. For example, Cummins, which spends hundreds of millions of dollars a year on R&D related to producing the cleanest engines possible, is already working on solutions to meet emissions requirements that have not yet been established yet and won't take effect until 2013 or later. We're ready for everything in between. In the late 1990s, the North American diesel engine industry reached agreement with the Environmental Protection Agency to move up the, the January 1, 2004 emission standards to October 1, 2002. The challenge of meeting this new deadline turned out to be very significant, and beginning in 2001, some of Cummins' competitors fought to push the date back to 2004, and even 
ultimately chose to page huge penalties, in one case well over $200 million, rather than to meet the deadline as promised. Cummins made this, the decision that the right thing to do was to live up to the promise it made with everyone else and invested heavily to meet the 2002 deadline for the new emission standards. This was a time when the company was struggling through one of its worst recessions in anyone's memory, and many of our comp competitors, and unfortunately customers, were arguing for delay. Our market share fell to the lowest level in decades as our fight against the delay became clearer and clearer to our customers. Nonetheless, we didn't budge. We believed it was the right thing to do. As it turned out, the results of our actions were good for both Cummins and the environment. Cummins was first to market with a new and improved product that met the tougher emission standards on time and earned respect from the customers as a supplier that was true to its word. Cummins used its work then to meet the, to use the work that we did to meet the 2002 emission standards as a springboard for future development efforts to meet the 2004 in some markets and then 2007 standards. Uh, and our share has continued to grow ever since. Today, Cummins prides itself on being a technology leader that, in fact, welcomes stringent emissions regulation as a source of competitive advantage. It's a terrific example of how doing the right thing can also be good for business. But I've got to tell you, being smack dab in the middle of this, it was pretty damn scary along the way. I wanted to share these or these three stories to illustrate the point that ethical leadership can take several forms. It may be taking a corporate stand on an important societal issue, such as racism. It may be making a decision that knowingly affects some stakeholders negatively, but you believe is right overall. Or it might be a willingness to make the investment necessary to live up to your commitments to your customers, to the environment, and to the communities in which we live and work. In all those cases, in countless other smaller instances, the decisions that were made didn't happen by accident. They were the result of us following guiding principles that have been articulated throughout the organization and which lead all of us in our decision-making processes. At Cummins, those principles are aligned through our vision, mission, and core values. They are articulated in the Cummins Code of Business Conduct, which was just updated this past year and was available for anyone who wanted to grab a copy as you came, in, came into, the, into the room. Um, in that, you'll see that Cummins' vision, now we're an, an engine, an engine component power gen company, our vision is making people's lives better by unleashing the power of Cummins. That's our vision of our future. That simple statement incorporates three important ideas. Making people's lives better means that every day, each of us strives to make a positive difference in our lives as well as those of our customers and other stakeholders. We accomplish this by generating electricity, putting engines and machines that provide jobs and help economies, providing filters that make the environment cleaner, and working to enhance the communities in which we live and work. Unleashing is a powerful, action-oriented word by design. It means that people are trusted and encouraged to act, including taking reasonable risks to improve our company and our community, the communities in which we operate. The power of Cummins is not limited to engines and generators. It includes all of our businesses and also refers to the energy, ideas, and deeds of our people. The vision, this vision, establishes our long-term view and defines who we want to be. It is designed to provide inspiration and direction for the business and, more importantly, for our employees. Companies cannot succeed long-term without the full commitment of their employees. And employees have a need to know where they are heading so they can contribute to the journey. One of the things we do to gain their full commitment is to encourage employees to serve and improve the communities in which we operate and they live. This is the simple definition of our core value of, of corporate responsibility. We know that we can only be as good as the communities in which we operate and from which we draw our services. It is in the self-interest of the company and our employees to help ensure that our communities are the best they can be. Today, under the guidance of Cummins Foundation, we have about 150 employee-led community involvement teams, we call them CITs, 
Each of these CITs directs a number of projects and events within their respective uh, uh, communities, and they have done some pretty amazing things. In the U.S., they've helped organize efforts to better align secondary and post-secondary education with the needs of their community. In Memphis, for example, our CIT became the prime partner for Lemoyne Owen College, an historically black college, in order to successfully help it regain accreditation and return to financial solvency. As a Six Sigma company, the CITs have used our Six Sigma belts to help improve service and reduce costs in hospitals, in city governments, and numerous local uh, NGOs, and train the people within those organizations to be able to do more in the future. In July 2007, torrential rains, lightning strikes, and mud flows battered cities in China, resulting in the worst flooding in more than 100 years. The CIT at our joint venture in Chongqing surprised our local JV partner, who was located in the same town, with its swift response to providing short-term housing, food, and support to flood victims. In nearby uh, Bei Miao County, with the support of our foundation, it led the effort to rebuild a school that was completely destroyed by the flood and is, is open today. After the devastating earthquake in China earlier this year, uh, our people got together and decided they were going to donate all their labor and all the par all parts uh, for a few months to help the authorities respond quickly to a truly horrible situation. In Brazil, after discussions with the unofficial mayor of a ghetto near our factory, over the years now, our local CIT created an elementary school. We have, we have 600 students in the elementary school now. Supported the creation of a new child care center. Built, and through a lot of rigmarole, uh, built a health care clinic and recruited doctors to work in it. And constructed most recently, and we, we uh, uh, were there for the commissioning uh, late last year, a community civic and cultural center for the area. Uh, in Mexico, we've established small businesses to employ single mothers and create job opportunities for the blind, businesses they eventually own and run. Uh, uh, in Pune, India, we worked with the authorities, excuse my language, damn difficult process in India, to create the Cummins College of Engineering for Women in 1992. Today, it has more than 1,800 women across India now attending. And this past year, so far we've been doing computer science, electrical engineering, electronic engineering, and this past year finally got agreement to create a mechanical engineering department, uh, uh, which we launched uh, uh, this past year. In turn, the women graduates uh, from this program that we hired from the school found and led an effort to improve the quality of learning at, a, at the Pune School for Blind, Young Blind Girls, and have also enabled some of the girls to have their vision restored. The efforts of our CITs to bring people and organizations together in order to make their respective communities better, as I said, never ceases to amaze me. And while our communities certainly improve, our employees also get stronger and better through their involvement in these efforts. The core values of the corporation have existed throughout our history, and we expect them to last well into our future. These are the rules we follow in conducting our business, kind of our ethical compass. In Cummins' case, we define who we are by defining what we value. Demonstrating corporate responsibility, as our CITs do every day, is one of our corporate values. As our acting with integrity, which to us means striving to do the right thing always and always doing what we say we're going to do. Fostering innovation, delivering superior results, embracing diversity, and being involved globally are the other core values that, at our core. Our vision and these values helped us create a mission, the path we follow to get to our vision and manifest our values. Our mission is to unleash the power of Cummins, by partnering with customers to make sure they succeed, exceeding customer expectations with excellent products and services, motivating employees to act like owners working together, demanding that everything we do leads to a cleaner, safer, healthy, and healthier environment, 
and creating wealth for all stakeholders. Vision, mission, values. These are our guiding principles. They communicate to stakeholders our company's direction, how it intends to get there, and what values it supports. They say, this is who we are and what we stand for. Without that bedrock foundation, I believe it would be, it's impossible for any company to achieve sustained growth and lasting success. I hope you can tell we take this stuff pretty seriously. We review it periodically, most recently in the late 99 and early 2000 time frame, Cummins leaders received in an organized way input from thousands of employees around the world before settling on the statements we now use back in, in the middle of 2000. Once the vision, mission, and values were revised and unveiled, we spent considerable time and expense educating our workers on these principles, driving alignment. And still we make mistakes. We're human, after all, and the world, as well as our business, has become increasingly complex over the years. No system, no matter how well devised or articulated, is foolproof. What is essential, however, is that we strive to do the right thing every time and that we learn from our mistakes so that we don't repeat them. Our guiding principles provide the foundation for our efforts, but alone they are not enough to ensure success. Strong leaders are absolutely necessary to help connect employees to the vision and mission and to help them understand how the strategy and performance objectives fit into that vision and mission. I want to just to take just a moment and comment on the special role that leaders play in promoting our vision, mission, and values at Cummins. We hold our leaders to a higher standard. We expect them to set the example for ethical behavior as well as encourage, if not lead, community involvement. Sometimes that means having to make hard decisions when they slip up, which happens to all companies from time to time. We had two such cases in the past year. In one case, the talented, very talented, long-term leader and employee of a Cummins-led joint venture in India had to be fired when we discovered he had developed an inappropriate business relationship with an outside vendor. In that case, we first learned of the situation through an employee who felt empowered to share his concerns with our ethics investigators. In the second case, a member of the board of directors, in fact, the senior member of the board of directors of our partner of another joint venture, this time in China, was relieved of his duties when he failed to disclose on his annual disclosure statement a serious conflict of interest involving his wife, who ran a business that supplied the joint venture. In this case, we had to work with our Chinese partners who were reluctant to force their employee and leader of their side out, out because he was a long-time terrific employee in their minds. But only by developing a strong relationship with our partner were we able to make them understand the importance of our values and why we felt it was necessary to take such strong action. Strong leaders create an environment in which talented people can flourish. They help channel employees' excitement and energy towards problem solving, meeting customer needs, delivering results, and making a positive contribution to the broader community where they live and work. They encourage innovation and calculated risk-taking by allowing people to make the occasional mistake without fear of penalty. As mentioned earlier, the term we use at Cummins is unleashed. We want employees to feel they own the company and are free to do what is right so that innovation can blossom across the organization. If and when they see something they believe is unethical, we encourage employees to bring their concerns forward, as happened in one of the situations I just mentioned earlier this year. We also allow employees to share their concerns anonymously through a global ethics hotline in every language you can imagine, and our code of conduct expressly forbids retaliate, retaliation against any employee who raises an ethical concern. Once it is clear that leadership is supported, a critical element of sustained growth has to do with creating the right environment, making sure the atmosphere is such that people are inspired to do their best work and reach their full potential. It's what everybody wants to do in life. At Cummins, establishing the right environment is a part of a larger set of practices called the Cummins Operating System that has been created to guide the day-to-day -day work of our employees in a way that allows us consistently to consistently meet the needs of our customers with the best possible products and services. 
Create an environment where employees feel valued and empowered to innovate, using a well-defined set of values to guide our daily actions, and tying those values to a broadly articulated mission and vision where, uh, where, where the central premise is that the company is only as strong as the communities it serves and supports. That's the framework for success that Cummins has established over the past 90 years. It's tempting to boil it all down to simply doing the right thing. And that's certainly an important part of our ethical compass at Cummins, but there's more to it than that. Now, more than ever, corporations with their significant resources and expertise have the ability to create positive social impact on a substantial scale. This opportunity to do the right thing is more than an exercise in philanthropy. The positive change that results from a well-defined and strategic approach to corporate responsibility and ethical leadership makes good business sense. More than that, I think corporate responsibility and ethical leadership have become essential to the success of any global enterprise, especially today. Or as James Joseph, a former Cummins officer and the first U.S. ambassador to South Africa during the Nelson Mandela administration and currently a professor of the practice of uh, public policy studies at Duke, so succinctly observed, business has entered an era where ethics is power. As was often the case, Erwin Miller was well ahead of his time when he eloquently captured the value of a thoughtful approach to corporate responsibility in remarks delivered to the National Industrial Conference Board Public Affairs Conference in New York nearly 40 years ago. He said, business has a very large stake in the quality of society within which it operates. We flourish only as we are rooted in a society which is healthy, orderly, just, and which grants freedom and scope to individuals and their lawful enterprises. Mr. Miller's words are as true today as ever, perhaps even more so, as the challenges we face as a company and a society become increasingly complex, and there's too many de decision makers who are still motivated by selfish interests rather than common good. If you remember nothing else tonight, I suggest you keep in mind the words of Gandhi. Be the change you want to see in the world. So thank you for your attention tonight, and I'd be glad to take uh, any questions on the subject I talked about or otherwise. So again, thanks for listening. <coughs> questions? Now wait a minute. I guess it goes again. Are these the planted questions? <laughs> Um, actually, earlier you mentioned that you're ready for new emission standards up to 2013. So would Cummins ever consider putting those engines out in the market before those standards are required? Um, depending on the set of circumstances, yes. In fact, we did that in 2007. Uh, we introduced a, a, a line of engines, our most popular line of engines, uh, that already met the 2010 standard. And uh, we surprised the marketplace because we kept it quiet. We said nothing. Uh, and we uh, announced in January of 07 we were introducing those engines that already met the 2010 standard. So simple answer is yes. You know, a lot of things have to come together to make it work. But the simple answer is yes. Other questions? What advice would you give to our students here as far as... Uh, you know, ethical behavior at the beginning of their career as opposed to some of the examples you gave more senior levels? Well, uh, I think, uh, did, if, did you hear the question? Uh, what advice would I give to young people starting their career uh, in terms of uh, ethical, um, uh, from an ethics point of view? Well, I think the general premise I've used or talked about in the, in the words, uh, strive to do the right thing, applies at high levels and it applies at low levels. And, uh, and I think in any organization you join, that should be the thing you got in the back of your head. How do I sort out what's the right thing to do? It's not easy, all right? Uh, it means you have to ask a lot of questions, you have to keep your eyes and ears open, and you need to do a good job of thinking laterally, not just functionally, wherever it is you happen to work. And so I think uh, uh, if you're looking at a company, I'd sure, if I were in your shoes, I know I'd told all my nieces and nephews, of, and I have many, who have either recently joined organizations or are getting ready to, this is a subject you should ask a lot of questions about uh, in terms of does the company 
have a policy or not. Uh, how do they teach people about it? How do they enforce it? Does it matter? Can they give you examples of where they made decisions that were ethically correct that were bad for business? That's the sure test, right? And uh, so I think things like that I think are important and you ought to be engaging in while you're looking at opportunities uh, before you join the company. And then once you join the company, you know, you're, you're a junior member, so you have to kind of watch your P's and Q's a little, but that shouldn't stop you from asking good questions and taking an interest in um, laterally in the things the business is up to, whether it, you're directly involved in it or in and around it. Yep. Uh, studies have shown that companies with strong CSR programs actually retain employees at higher rates than those that don't have strong CSR programs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll give you a, It's true in the U.S. for us. Uh, but one of the things, I just, I just came back Sunday night from China, uh, and I go there frequently, and India. But, uh, um, and one of the things we look at metric-wise is retention. And, uh, and we compare ourselves to a small group of companies that are definitely in uh, our area, and we also compare ourselves to industry at large. And, uh, and we are significantly... Uh, better on retention uh, than uh, the industry at large or our comparator group. And we attribute that directly uh, to uh, uh, what we try and do from an ethics and a community responsibility point of view. Uh, one of the things I did while I was there is we had an award ceremony for certain groups of employees. One, uh, we had uh, uh, some leaders and, and some of the people who really did the work involved in responding um, uh, to the situation in China earlier this year, the impact of the earthquake. I mean, we had people out there in the middle of nowhere uh, with no way of getting out who were spending literally every waking moment repairing vehicles and keeping vehicles going to try and find people who might still be alive, right? And, uh, uh, and so we had a, we had a, in Beijing, invited them all to Beijing, and we did a nice sort of ceremony and award, award session uh, for them. And in fact, I got an email today uh, uh, from, uh, from that group of employees and how thrilled they were with, uh, with the recognition that they got. Uh, um, um, you know, one of the other objectives we did, this isn't exactly an, an ethical issue per se, but it's, uh, it's definitely community responsibility. One of the things we've been doing for several years is powering the Beijing bus fleet with uh, uh, engines that meet standards that are greater than the current existing standards in Beijing. And, uh, and in fact, we have um, around 3,000, for instance, bus engines running at compressed natural gas uh, rather than diesel fuel. And the ones we do have in running in diesel fuel are running at the same standard that exists in Europe, at least all the new ones. And we're gradually replacing some of the old ones, uh, uh, displacing local Chinese suppliers for the most part. And so we probably have power now about 60 to 65, about two-thirds of a 22,000 bus fleet, right? Uh, one of the challenges we were given uh, by, the, by the city of Beijing was to have all buses in the Olympics, in the Olympic grounds, all the buses that were in there were powered by Cummins. And most of them were compressed natural gas. Some of them were Euro 4, uh, current European level emissions. Uh, uh, we're in that area, and we were given a target, zero breakdowns uh, for the, uh, uh, the period of time by our customer. I remember this well because at the beginning of the year, I met with the customer when we got the target, you know, and I didn't want to drop my jaw right in front of him. But anyway, the, uh, so we said, okay, that's what the customer wants. How are we going to do it? So we pulled together people from our distributor, our service organization, and sat them down and said, this is the challenge. Uh, we have to together figure out how we're going to do it. And in fact, that's what we accomplished, zero breakdowns. Uh, uh, almost 2,000 buses running the whole period, uh, and we also recognized that group uh, of folks, who, uh, most of whom didn't see a lick of the Olympics, even though they were on the Olympics grounds, because they were doing everything to make sure that those vehicles kept right on running. So I think uh, you got to say it's important, uh, that's key. You've got to educate and train people as to why it's important in your view. 
And, uh, and then you've got to recognize the heck out of it. Lots of little pats on the back and some other recognition to tell people you're doing the right thing. Right? And, uh, uh, and it has a definite impact on retention. I mean, think of people, particularly people who grow up in a community and want to stay there, you know, which a lot of our employees do as you work your way down through the organization. They want their communities to be the best they can be. And they're always struggling with, what can I do to help? All right? And so uh, a, the CITs uh, have been uh, an absolute terrific thing for pulling together large groups of employees to figure out ways of how they can contribute. And uh, I mean, it is an unbelievable list of things that they do. And, they're, and that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I would say, hell yes, in our experience, uh, uh, a strong uh, community uh, involvement uh, a, a program that's real uh, uh, and it uh, is definitely contributes to retention in an organization. Yeah, let me see if I can put it in a way that might make some a little sense that helps might help you think it through because I understand that some of the stuff is not totally obvious, right? Um, uh, the base of everything in business success over time is trust, right? If you don't build trust with your employees. If you don't build trust with your suppliers, you don't build trust with your customers, uh, not just relationships, trust. Uh, 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 your, chances are your relationship's not going to last a long period of time, or it's going to run into all kinds of issues. So part of striving to do the right thing and doing what you say you're going to do, I mean, which is, again, one of our core values, and that's how we define integrity, what it means to us, uh, is the result of which is building trust, which is the most f fundamental underpinning of creating a strong, ongoing business relationship with any party. So the way it joins together for us is thinking about how do you build trust. And it's a, you can build it, and then you can lose it. I mean, because people change in organizations on all sides, so it's something you have to stay attentive to. And for us... Uh, this principle of striving to do the right thing always, involving all the stakeholders so they get a chance to give their views and help you understand the impact. Uh, you, don't, you can't always accommodate everybody when you finally got to make a decision, uh, but the process builds trust, and that's the foundation for any kind of business. You know, there's a lot of books written. I laugh every time I see another article. I saw one recently uh, that says 50-50 joint ventures don't work. Crap, right? Uh, it's, they work if you build trust. And, uh, and, and we have a lot of 50-50 joint ventures in India, in China, in the U.S., I mean, all, all over the place. And they work because everyone's focused on understanding we're in the game together uh, and we must build trust between one another so we can make decisions that are good for the joint venture company, whatever it is. Right, and uh, so I don't know if this is helping you any, but it's an, uh, but anyway, I think if you think about it that way, uh, and you understand the importance of trust, you know, you can't build trust by telling lies. You can't build trust by saying I'm going to do this and then not doing it. All right, uh, you can't build trust if you show no evidence of try trying to do the right thing. Sometimes you're wrong. You try and do it, and you make a bad decision. Hell, it's happened. I've done it. All right, and uh, and so if you are, you admit it. You go back and. Do it over, right? Uh, but uh, so trust is, is, is core of any kind of relationship. Last question, Robert. I'm interested in how the hotline works. Do you get frivolous or malicious complaints? How are complaints or reports handled? And to whom does the person receiving them report? Uh, to the first part of your question, yes and yes. Uh, you asked, uh, do we get uh, malicious stuff that's not true? Absolutely. 
Um, uh, well, and the second one was uh, uh, well, trivial. trivial. Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, what we try and do for our, through our training, uh, and some of it is repeated several times in this uh, manual, is we give people lots of channels. You can go to your boss, you can go to your HR department, you can go to law, you can go whatever. Uh, we have plastered all over our facilities in the local language the ethics hotline number, whatever it is in terms of getting from, from that location. We tell people a variety of ways they can get into their computer and find the number if they don't want to be seen like they're writing down at home or at work and stuff like that. And so we get phone calls. And um, uh, typically, um, a lot of the initial claim will go to uh, an extension of what we call an ethics investigator group. Uh, and this is a group that's not just located in the U.S. They're in other parts of the world. Um, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, and this group, when these come in, uh, is the primary group in most cases that leads the investigation. Uh, and we investigate everything, even if it sounds frivolous. Right? We, just, uh, we may discard it pretty quickly after we get into it, but we look at everything. If it looks like it's a fraud issue, then we immediately pull a lawyer in from the law department. If it looks like there's something involving fraud. Uh, we might, if it's a treatment issue, uh, we might... Pull, get it attached to someone in HR, a uh, senior person who works with the uh, investigation group. Um, I, you know, I just had a case um, recently. A um, young woman whom I know in, a, in, a, in Japan who works for us, uh, and she contacted me about an issue and, uh, uh, through email and, went and said, here's my issue, please, can you help us do something about this? And uh, I talked to one of the senior bosses of the office and our head HR person and said, you know, what, what options do we have in terms of getting at this because it wasn't a hotline call. And, uh, uh, and so I went back to the employee and I said, we can do this two ways. I said, one, the, boss, the senior person is coming into the office soon and we can arrange for you to meet that person however you want and take them through the issue. Because she obviously wasn't hiding it in, the, in a sense or wanting to be purely anonymous. Or we'll send an send an investigator in. Your choice. Uh, she came back and she said, send the investigator in. And so that's what we're doing. And uh, 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 to kind of take, take, uh, uh, to kind of take a look at the situation. So that one didn't come from the hotline. I mean, we get them every which way. But, uh, uh, and we encourage people uh, to talk to their supervisors or the senior HR person in their location or the law department, but we don't require it. They can go, they can zoom anywhere they want. What we, but we w do want to hear about issues and uh, that they see. Uh, I know I've been involved in one fairly recently where a small group of employees were absolutely convinced that um, other members in their organization, in their location, were committing fraud. In this case, it was insurance-related fraud. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, on one hand, that allegation turned out to be untrue. But uh, we discovered by going through the investigation that it is likely, we're not to the bottom of it yet, it's likely that we have a, uh, a relatively senior supervisor uh, issue in terms of what they're doing and how they're doing it that has caused people to be super sensitive to uh, uh, a bunch of things who got them convinced that something that was going on was fraud. And, and we got a lawyer involved for that reason. And it's clear there was no fraud commit, committed, but we have an issue. So we're, we're taken off on that issue, which was not the one they reported. But that was the underlying cause for why this was happening. Are you getting a yeah. feel? Okay. Well, Joe, thank you very much. Got a little uh, gift for you to t take uh -huh. back to Columbus to wear the fact that you're uh, Notre Dame and Irish on your... Uh -huh. It's not quite sleeve, okay. but uh, right. please join me in thanking Joe for an excellent presentation. Joe. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I'm sure he'd be willing to answer any per uh, questions you'd like to ask of him uh, individually. Thank you.